The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, is now in a strange state of mind. They earnestly want people to spend money, and in line with this, its central bank has been printing money at a speed that's the fastest in the world. On the other hand, they are unwilling to give the Chinese people a real break. They don't seem to understand that the extra money printed hasn't been put into circulation. What's really going on? We'll reveal the secret at the end of this episode. Let's start with China's May Day holiday. China's May Day holiday runs from May 1st to 5th. It seems to be five rest days in a row, but the phrase, May Day is actually only a one-day holiday, has been trending on hot lists. It has sparked heated discussions. Because two of the five days land on the weekend, the other two days are shuffled from other rest days. That is to say, after the public enjoys the long holiday, they have to pay back the extra days they took. The intent of this model is obvious. It isn't to allow the population to take a break and rest, but to pool the off days together to create a long weekend to accommodate travel, thus to boost the spending. A large number of netizens have expressed the wish for normal holidays and two-day weekends. Some Chinese media have reported on this too. Every year, shuffling rest days together to create a long holiday has aroused heated debates. Before the May Day holiday arrived, the term May Day is actually only a one-day holiday has rushed to the top of the search list again. May Day holiday has one day off as stipulated by law, but it has been pieced together and turned into a five-day holiday by moving rest days from weekends. It's unbelievable. Whether rest day should be moved around is a matter of opinion. On the one hand, a one-day holiday can't support people's plans to travel. On the other hand, the disruption of work rhythms by artificially moving rest days can have the effect of exhausting people before and after the holiday. Some people even joke that in order to make up for the holiday, the entire April two-day weekends were changed to single-day weekends. A holiday that exhausts people physically and mentally loses the very meaning of a holiday. Vacation shouldn't be a fake holiday. The significance of holiday isn't simply to stimulate spending and promote social and economic development. We shouldn't consider holidays only for their short-term economic value. Our country has 11 public holidays, which is not less than those in Europe and the US, and is even in the middle to upper level in the world. What's really missing is the number of paid public holidays. For example, in the European Union, the annual paid holiday period cannot be less than four weeks. Therefore, apart from shuffling around the rest days, shouldn't we tailor our holidays to the local conditions and have more paid time off so that people can have a more genuine sense of well-being? Most of the comments below the video agree with what the host said. For example, someone left a comment. Paid holiday is really good. We don't have to flock to the scenic area at a certain specific time, but really enjoy it at our own pace. It can also bring steady revenue to the local economy. What's the point of only relying on a couple of long holidays, such as May Day or the national holiday? Many companies in China have made it a rule to pay more for working on holidays. It has resulted in the working class, whose money is tight, would rather work during holidays. At the bottom of the barrel, the regular wage is low, but overtime pay is high. In fact, they rely on overtime pay to make ends meet. So one netizen commented, the problem now is not that there aren't enough public holidays, but that the existing holidays aren't fully implemented. For example, for the annual holidays, we can consider getting rid of the holiday pay that may be triple for working during the annual holidays. If one doesn't take the annual holidays, so be it. There shouldn't be a subsidy for it. Administrative fines will be imposed on companies that don't guarantee annual holidays. In a sense, it's to guarantee employees will have their personal annual holidays stipulated by the law. The response from others is, are there any consequences for violating the labor laws? When the law doesn't get enforced, it's just a waste. So did the five days of long holiday pieced together achieve the goal of stimulating consumption? Reuters reports that China's May Day holiday saw a surge in travel, but people didn't spend much. The report reads, Travel by rail and car across China surged on Wednesday, the first day of a major public holiday, as consumers remained focused on keeping expenses down in a challenged economy. In the run-up to the five-day holiday that began with May Day, domestic airline fares were falling. Even so, more travelers were opting to drive rather than fly, or had booked early to save. According to China's official media, about 58 million vehicles were expected to hit the road each day during the holiday while railroads carried more than 20 million passengers on the first day of the holiday alone. 
According to CCTV, the number of travelers in the first quarter increased by nearly 17% year-on-year. Looking at the visa data, the popular foreign destinations for the five-day vacation are Japan, South Korea, Australia, Vietnam, Canada, and New Zealand. Statistics from a number of travel service platforms show that from the booking volume of long-distance tours, among them cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, Hangzhou, are most favored by tourists. A noteworthy phenomena is that according to Ctrip's travel platform, many Chinese people's destinations for this year's May Day holiday are counties. China's fourth-tier cities and below, especially the county, towns, and county-level cities, their tourism market grew significantly. Hotel booking orders in the county market grew 68% year-on-year, and scenic spot ticket orders grew 151% year-on-year, a higher growth rate than the broader national market. This is, of course, due to the economic downturn in recent years. People have downgraded their consumption and embarked on a mode called poor travel. One of the ways of poor travel is to visit the more remote small counties. Therefore, on May 1st, the young people who are smart with money made the term May Day County Tour popular on the hot search. The phrase was used in headlines by various Chinese media reports. One netizen mocked, having no money is described as being smart with money. Who doesn't want to go to renowned tourist attractions if they have money? Another said bluntly, In fact, the main reason to visit the county is to travel cheaply, to save money. Why? People have practically no money. They can only go to a more cost-effective place to travel. Before May 1st, a college student posted on Weibo asking, Where can a college student go with a budget of 700 yuan who intends to do poor travel? 700 yuan is less than $100. It triggered heated discussions among Chinese people. On Chinese social media, many people complained. The experience of poor travel is terrible. In order to save money, one has to do a lot of research and price comparison. Buy cheap seats, stay in a hostel, and snatch up discounts. Some have to even camp out in parks, subways, and hot pot restaurants, etc. Not only did it waste a lot of time, but when they finally arrived at the attractions, they were exhausted mentally and physically. It's hard to immerse oneself in the local experience and enjoy the local culture and people. One person posted a funny video explaining how he realized his four wonderful travel plans during the May Day holiday. His plans were number one, to watch the sea. Number two, to go to scenic spots to see waterfalls. Number three, to see mountain Tai once. And number four, to travel around the world. Here is how he did it. Hong Kong is also feeling the trend of people traveling frugally from the mainland. At one time, Hong Kong was one of the shopping paradises for mainland tourists. Dressed in a bright pink dress and a pair of sunglasses, mainland Chinese tourist Laura Li, along with dozens of other tourists, was busy posing outside the old Yoma Di police station, a must-visit popular filming location featured on the Chinese social media platform Xiao Hong Shu, known as China's answer to Instagram. From the northeastern Liaoning province, it was Li's first time visiting Hong Kong with her cousin Diego Deng during China's Labor Day Golden Week holidays. Li, 27, and Deng, 20, are among China's Generation Z who skip shopping at luxury stores when they visit Hong Kong. Instead, they have opted to do a two-day city walk to explore local neighborhoods. Traveling mainly by the MTR, the city's public railway network, Li planned to spend where necessary and save where possible. This is also why she decided to stay overnight in the border city Shenzhen instead of Hong Kong. Because if it's the same price range, I can stay in better hotels in places nearby like Shenzhen with better environment. And coming to Hong Kong from Shenzhen isn't too much trouble either. It only took me about an hour to get here today. So it's still better to choose to stay in Shenzhen because it's cheap and economical. What I want to achieve is spending where necessary and saving where possible. The city welcomed more than 180,000 mainland travelers from across the border on the first day of the Golden Week holidays. However, there were very few customers outside luxury boutiques on Jim Sajue famous Shopping Street Canton Road, making it a stark contrast to the crowds at popular city walk photo spots. Uh, the China economy recovery speed was not as good as what we expected. So that's why when people utilize their disposable income, so they now become more cautious. 
So traveling is not a highly necessary activity. So that's why they prefer spending less money on traveling and even other luxurious consumption. In China today, if you look closely, you will find that both big cities and small counties are trying to package themselves as a tourist spot. For local governments, it seems that tourism has become the main way to revitalize the economy. But now it seems that trying to promote tourism to revitalize the economy isn't working either. In the face of the economic downturn, China's central bank has been flooding the nation with money over the past two years to stimulate consumption. There seems to be nothing wrong with that idea. The U.S. uses a similar approach, but why doesn't it work for China's economy? Here we take a look at China's current rate of money printing. Recently, China's central bank released its March 2024 social, financial, and fiscal statistics. According to the report, China's M2 balance at the end of March 2024 was 304.8 trillion yuan, or about 42 trillion, up 8.3 percent year on year. This means that China's M2 has entered a 300 trillion era. M2 stands for broad money, which covers almost all forms of money, including cash in circulation, demand deposits, time deposits, large certificates of deposit, and so on. The size of a country's M2 can also be interpreted as the amount of money printed, which, when you apply the time, can reflect how fast a country is printing money. So, how fast is China printing money? At the end of 2000, China's M2 was 13 trillion yuan, reaching 100 trillion yuan in March 2013. It took 12 years to add 87 trillion yuan. In January 2020, it exceeded 200 trillion yuan. It took 7 years to add 100 trillion yuan. In March 2024, it exceeded 300 trillion yuan. It took only 4 years to add 100 trillion yuan. There was a clear acceleration in the speed of money printing. In 2022, China's increased M2 was 28 trillion yuan, or roughly over 4 trillion. It was about the size of Germany's GDP, or equivalent to a year's worth of work by the Germans. In 2023, China's increased M2 was 26 trillion yuan, equivalent to that of India. China's total M2 is twice that of the US, and close to the combined total of the US, the Eurozone, and Japan. American M2 is 150 trillion yuan, Eurozone is 120 trillion yuan, and Japan is 60 trillion yuan, totaling 330 trillion yuan, comparable to China's 300 trillion. However, the US M2 doesn't include corporate deposits of more than US 100,000. If this amount is taken into account, China's M2 is roughly 1.4 times that of the US. Chinese officials have captured such differences to explain that China's M2 is actually not excessive. In the U.S., corporate time deposits exceeding 100,000 U.S. dollars aren't included in the M2. However, in China, the M2 covers both the current and time deposits of corporations with the various amounts. This is one of the reasons that China's M2 money supply is higher than that of the U.S. Experts in China are also trying to convince the public that overissuing money is actually a good thing. For example, when an enterprise applies for a loan from a bank for its production and operation, the loan amount will become a deposit for that enterprise once it's issued by the bank. If the enterprise uses the loan fund to pay wages, the money will become employee's income and then resident's deposit. If the enterprise uses it to buy raw materials, the money will flow to other businesses and increase deposits of those businesses or individuals. This is how loans become deposits. Therefore, the growth of M2 money largely reflects the growth of deposits. Generally speaking, the more M2 there is, the more nominal GDP is generated. An M2 to GDP characterizes the degree of monetary deepening of a national economy. In layman's terms, M2 to GDP is the degree of monetization of a society, that is, the value of one dollar. Since the founding of the CCP in 1949, over the past 70 years, 10,000 yuan in China has become less valuable. Using economic data, we can have a look at the GDP corresponding to 1 yuan of broad money, hereafter referred to as 1 yuan. In 1952, the monetization level was 15%, and 1 yuan corresponded to 6.7 yuan of GDP. In 1978, 1 yuan corresponded to 3.17 yuan of GDP. 
In 1990, 1 yuan was about 1.23 yuan of GDP. In 2008, 1 yuan equaled 0.67 yuan of GDP. In 2022, 1 yuan corresponds to 0.45 yuan of GDP. In 2023, 1 yuan was 0.43 yuan of GDP. As of March 2024, the degree of monetization is 238%. And 1 yuan of broad money corresponds to 0.42 yuan of GDP. What about other countries? In 2023, the M2 to GDP ratio will be 75% in the US, 113% in the Eurozone, 85% in India, and 233% in China. That is to say, the GDP value corresponding to $1 in other countries is much higher and is much more valuable. The above data shows that the motor of China's money printing machine is burning hotter and hotter, while the motor of economic development is getting cooler and cooler. Just like a train, the amount of fuel used is getting higher, but the speed of the train is getting slower. It's no longer good. Like an aged cow, it eats grass but can't do much work. When the CCP prints more money, it means that the degree of financial bubbles is getting bigger, and the money people have is worth less. In plain language, one can buy less stuff with the same amount of money. So how much is 10,000 yuan worth in China today compared to different points in time in the past? Measured according to this year's national annual per capita deposits compared with those of different historical time points, today's 10,000 yuan is equivalent to 0.5 yuan in 1955, 4 yuan in 1978, 120 in 1994, 1500 in 2008, and 6,800 in 2020. In the 1980s and 1990s in China, anyone who had 10,000 yuan in savings was called a 10,000 yuan household, roughly equivalent to today's million yuan household. In the 1990s, a per capita wage income of around 500 to 600 yuan could support a family. At that time, rice cost 50 cents a caddy, pork cost 2 yuan a caddy, School tuition fees range from 50 cents to a few yuan a year, and per capita annual medical expenses were around 100 yuan. There was no need or pressure to buy cars or homes. Nowadays, with a monthly income of 10,000 yuan, one can be considered to be a member of the middle class in China, but there is no guarantee for the quality of life. There is not much left after paying the mortgage, and a single trip to the hospital for an illness can cost several thousand yuan. If a family member is sick and stays in ICU for 30 days, the middle class may have to drop down the social ladder as it may cost him a property. Why is it that after the epidemic, Western countries have issued so much money but haven't seen terrible hyperinflation? The US uses direct financing. The Federal Reserve directly injects money into the bond and stock markets through QE, quantitative easing. The efficiency of capital use is high. Moreover, the U.S. is a country with private ownership. Money will quickly flow into personal asset accounts through the financial market and consumer spending is strong. The Chinese government puts money into the market more through credit and commercial banks and policy banks. The money received by various governments and state-owned enterprises has been put back into banks as deposits due to the decline in real estate and the contraction of municipal bonds. China's stock market is a place for state-owned enterprises to raise money and can't really increase the wealth of retail investors. 300 trillion yuan of funds haven't really flowed into the market. It has been idling in the financial system, resulting in the kind of overissuance of money in China today. In addition, real estate accounts for 70% of Chinese people's wealth. Even if ordinary Chinese people have made money, they spend most of their income on buying homes. Moreover, they can't rely on the government for education and health care. People have to save or invest in real estate or stocks when they have extra money. In other words, only a small portion of ordinary Chinese people's money goes into circulation. Furthermore, the CCP corruption is staggering. After the credit flows into state-owned enterprises and related infrastructure projects, half of the money has probably been embezzled. The money is hidden, turned into deposits, real estate, or transferred overseas. So this part doesn't go into circulation either. Another most important factor that leads to temporary deflation is probably the disappearance of a large Chinese population after the epidemic. It should be the biggest secret of the Beijing government today. The fact that a massive number of people have disappeared has created a surplus of demand for housing and industries all across the board. 
and ultimately a collapse in the housing prices and prices in other industries. Many economists around the world find the direction of the Chinese economy strange and hard to make sense of. Perhaps this is the real reason.